Today's episode is brought to you by Brilliant.org. And welcome back to another video where we're going to do another episode of rapid fire quick tips on how to become a better reader. And I haven't done one of these in a while. But today we're going to dive into one of these discussions that might trigger your father at a dinner table or it might not, you know, it depends on who he is, which is the subject of how do you interpret art or more specifically, how do we go about reading literature as an art form? Or how do we go about even defining what literature is as an art form? Because the problem with literature sometimes is, is because it's comprised out of pages and pages upon pages of words. And since words in our society are, they're so prevalent, they're ubiquitous. If you open up an official document, there are words printed on the page. If you just go browse on the internet, there are words everywhere. Even when you scroll through certain Instagram, Instagram reels or TikToks, you know, words are there to signify things. And because as human beings, we're very good at using words to communicate with one another to a certain extent. Well, words just don't seem like they can't be used to create art sometimes. And ordinarily, when you think about art, you think about some abstract painting or you think about some Baroque period painting. But sometimes people have a harder time understanding literature as an art form. So first of all, since today's subject is all about how to experience literature or the fundamental question of like, how do you actually get more out of your literature reading experience, let's just define, first of all, define literature as an art form. We really need to start treating literature as an art form with a barrier of entry. I mean, even for visual art, sometimes you walk into a gallery, you're trying to interpret a piece of painting, and sometimes you have a really hard time trying to grasp the essential meaning of the artwork. Well, some critics even said there is no essential meaning, so you have to go through this whole mental gymnastics to really get a palpable sense of what this piece of artwork is all about. Well, the same goes for literature, and the basic assumption here is, if you know how to read, you should be able to read literature. But in this case, if we frame literature as a piece of art, we have to recognize that it actually takes some sort of like lens of interpretation, it actually takes some training to get really good at interpreting uh, a piece of literature, to get really good at this act called literary criticism. And when you begin to get through that barrier of entry, when you get to the point where you can extract feelings and emotions and sensations from a piece of literary work, that's when literature has the power to evoke new feelings, to change your perception about the world, to change your morals, or to completely upturn what you think was real, or what you think was wrong. But to get there in the first place, it takes a bit of training, it takes a bit of like reading a lot, it takes experience, it takes hours upon hours of engaging with literature. And here, I'm just gonna give you one of those pointers so you can go off and use this pointer to help you with your literary studies. Now, just like interpreting art and interpreting paintings, it's very easy to get overwhelmed by the sense of confusion. When you're standing in front of a painting, you ask yourself questions like, what am I supposed to feel? How do I get deeper into this piece of art? How can I you know, probe a little deeper so I understand this piece of art? And there's the key word, how do I understand this piece of work? And for literary studies, it's very much the same game that you're playing here. A fresh literature student usually gets overwhelmed by the same sense of confusion when they crack open a novel for the first time. Questions such as, why? Am I reading this? Questions such as why is this piece of literary work so significant in the history of literature? And you know, why did the author choose this imagery here instead of that imagery there? And sometimes the education system, especially in the humanities, are so good at supplying you with ready-made answers. Okay, the author did this because this is the most official reading from a critic. Or the theme of the novel is supposed to be this, because if you write an essay according to this theme, you'll get a higher mark than everyone else. That sometimes we don't really get that space of true engagement with a piece of literature uh, through leaning into that field of confusion, through really asking yourself the question instead of asking another critic or asking your teacher, Asking yourself the question, why am I experiencing this piece of work in this way that I'm experiencing right now? This actually reminds me of one of my favorite painters of all time, Francis Bacon. Uh, the first time when I saw one of his paintings at the NGV, uh, the National Gallery of Victoria over here in Melbourne, but the first thing that struck me was just how confusing the painting was. Why did Bacon choose the imagery of a drape to drape his subject? Why did he have such a fascination with the human body or with the male figure? And what was he trying to tell me through this painting? Is it merely just to lay out a human figure or was there something deeper? And obviously I didn't have an art critic next to me to help me understand the painting. So I had to sort of like hold these questions in my head 
get confused for a little bit before I search up answers on the internet. Now I'm embarking on this deep dive into Francis Bacon's life basically to really understand what his paintings are all about. And when we apply the same questions to literature, like why did the author choose this instead of that? It gives rise to what Ludwig Wittgenstein defined as a mental cramp. A mental cramp really happens when you encounter something that you haven't quite encountered before and you're sitting there bubbling with questions with no necessary solutions. But a trick here is to lean deeper into it. As Wittgenstein noted, philosophical problems arise when language goes on holiday. I want you to realize that when you're engaging with literature, you're not necessarily engaging with wide awake language. Wide awake language in literature could be a style that the author is trying to employ, but that itself is still kind of a stylistic choice. But sometimes when you read something a little more complicated or something a little hard to get through, you realize very quickly that the thing on the page is not the language that we speak on a daily basis. Just like how Francis Bacon's contorted figures is not exactly how human beings look in real life. That mismatch between what you know already about language or the language that you're speaking and literary language, that's what's gonna produce a lot of confusion and that's what gives rise to a mental cramp. And since schools have really trained us into problem solving machines instead of uh, natural wanderers, there's this urge to resolve the cramp ASAP by either closing the book or trying to find a solution on the internet because this literature is really confusing the hell out of you. And the argument that I'm trying to advance here is that if you lean deeper into that mental cramp, if you stay with the questions like, what was the author's intention? Or why did the author choose this form over another form? Or what am I supposed to feel when I'm reading this piece of literature? It actually facilitates a deeper engagement with the text from your perspective, instead of relying upon some external sources for solutions. So instead of viewing the cramp as something to run away from, instead of viewing confusion as something that you should resolve right away, because well, that's what you're supposed to do in schools, train yourself to get really comfortable with asking these questions. And that is what's going to give rise to interpretation and criticism, and maybe even down the track when you're more experienced with reading, you can even come up with your own interpretations that can agree or disagree with other critics' interpretations, and that's where the work of literary criticism really, really starts. And that's really the difference between postgrad literature work and undergrad literature work, because undergrad, you're spending a lot of time getting comfortable with the feel, but in postgrad, you're sort of experienced enough with the feel that you're comfortable enough to come up with your own interpretations, your own spins, and you can disagree with critics or the critics in the field in literature. But now we kind of have to answer a question, which is how do we lean into this confusion without going insane? I mean, a lot of us, we already have enough going on in our lives. You know, why would I add another thing called literature for me to get confused about? Because life is confusing enough as it is. Now, any periods of confusion, that are inherently just uncomfortable to be in. But yet, more experienced readers are more comfortable with grappling with that period of not knowing, with that period of confusion. To the point where if a puzzle case arises while you're reading a piece of literature, that's actually a great way to engage with a text. So instead of treating confusion as a sense of vice, you're treating it as uh, little breadcrumbs to lead you to your true understanding of this piece of work. So recently, as a part of my research, I read this brilliant paper that contained a lot of great points on how to read or how to learn how to read. And this excerpt really summarized everything I've been trying to, trying to explain to you. Quote, if the work of philosophy is to dispel the fog and get to a clear view of the particular problem that troubled us, in literary criticism, we can begin by asking, why this? We began then, not with a method, but with our own sense of confusion. If the critic doesn't have a problem, if nothing really puzzles her about the text, she really has no reason to investigate it. A reading is an attempt to get clear on something." End quote. And this idea of using your process of reading to get clear on something, it really reaches into the field called post-critique, which I'll explain in another video. That's such a huge rabbit hole that I don't wanna dive into right now. But think about it. If you are in a high school literature class, the teachers are very good at supplying you with a lens to interpret a text. And your essays sort of become this plug and play, you know, do I use a feminist reading on this lens or do I use a sort of like a postmodern post-structuralist critique on this piece of work? Or can I apply some sort of lens to give me some certainty about the text? But while you're doing this plug and play process, what you're really sacrificing is that ability to ask yourself, what do I experience from the text? How 
am I extracting anything meaningful from the text? So on the surface, you might be getting really high grades for your literature subject, but you haven't really learned how to read or think by yourself. The beauty with this method of reading, uh, viewing the process of reading as getting clear on something, it completely reverses the script and turns literature into kind of like a therapeutic practice. So you're reading it and certain parts of this book is really confusing you and you can use those points of confusion as entry points to really trot out your own understanding of this piece of text. And when you have more practice and experience in this field of literary criticism, the better your questions will become. They'll become a lot more in depth because you've sort of like chiseled your way through the surface level questions. And now you're really in the depth of this, um, this business called um, interpreting literature. And yes, some people do do it professionally. So I feel like this is all getting quite abstract. So let's ground this concept of reading as trying to get clear on something in a very practical example. A Soren Kierkegaard's masterpiece, Fear and Trembling, Kierkegaard wasn't like any other boys. Instead of just writing another theological treatise or philosophical treatise by laying out his arguments or laying out what he's gonna talk about, instead he started with four rewritings of the story of Abraham sacrificing his son. Because for him, the classical biblical tale confused him so much so that he felt the need to reread the story over and over and over again. And that sort of rereading turning to the four rewrites of the same story so that through reading he could get clear on Abraham's motivations. So when a normal person might read the story of Abraham and think to himself, well, that's pretty uh, self-explanatory. I should just take it on by faith. Kierkegaard was able to identify this mental cramp and he leaned into the mental cramp and this is why we have this book. He was eventually able to go beyond the story of Abraham and to lean into concepts like theology, faith, philosophy, and existentialism. And that's really what stronger readers do. They tend to notice these mental cramps or they tend to notice these problems with characters and with their motivations that uh, novice readers don't tend to notice. And from those better posed questions, they can really use these points of confusion as reference points to build up a very good critique of a piece of work or, or a really good piece of analysis of a piece of work. So that's all I have for this video, a slightly more conceptual look at the foundations of reading or ways of reading. Because if you practice the skill of asking the right questions enough, it can actually bleed into real life too. All of a sudden you're not just asking the right questions when you're reading literature. All of a sudden you're asking questions about the nature of reality, asking questions about information that you're taking in. All of a sudden you're evaluating your surroundings differently. And that's really the true power of liberal arts education or a, an education in literature. It transforms the way you look at reality and it transforms your attitude towards certain things and certain values and certain morals. And speaking of things that can really transform your view of reality, today's episode is brought to you by Brilliant.org, which is the easiest, simplest, and a really good way to learn mathematics and science. In 21st century, sometimes people have a hard time reconciling with this rapid progression with the maths and sciences. And as people in the humanities, sometimes we can be a little bit blind to those developments. My argument is if you want to be a well-rounded person, sometimes it helps to review some of the things that you used to despise in high school. Even though I was an okay mathematics student, I just really didn't like the subject that much until I realized it wasn't exactly about the content, but it was about the way that the schools taught it that really made me hate mathematics and science. But Berlian.org is fun and interactive. It features lessons every month. And among these monthly lessons, they contain lessons for basic principles and lessons for more advanced stuff. So it doesn't really matter where you're at with your skill level, Berlian.org has got something for everybody. So recently I started learning the principles of mathematical logic with Berlian.org because I'm trying to work through some works by Wittgenstein to, for, for this piece of research I'm doing for university. It's really helping me to understand the basic principles through illustrations, through interactive games, and through these little tests that they give you every lesson. So if you want to experience the magic of mathematics, data science, and artificial intelligence, right now you can get started for free at Brilliant.org or head over to Brilliant.org slash RC Walden for 20% off on your annual subscription. Thank you Brilliant.org for supplying us with such a great learning opportunity. And this is all I have for this video. Hope you guys have enjoyed it and I will see you in the next one. Take care and goodbye.